Welcome back to Backward Point Podcast. My name is Nazar Sayyad. I am the host and co-brother. Oh, wait, no. Co-host and brother uh, of Bashar Sayyad. I messed up that intro, but we're going to roll with it. Bashar, welcome to the podcast. What the heck is a co-brother? Bro, I don't know. I, you know, with the new baby, uh, Alhamdulillah, on the, you know, here, finally, I haven't had a single night of sleep in the past seven days. Well, that and because of Pakistan's horrendous loss against India, coupled together, it's just been a week of just agony and sleepless nights and just my baby looking back at me and saying, you promised me glory and you made me a Pakistan cricket fan. What is all this about? So it's a lot of questions, no answers for me. And that's why I did that mess up. I truly apologize to all of our millions of fans who listen. Uh, my brother is here as always and my co-host. Bashar Syed. Yeah. And uh, as always, Patreon subscribers, you guys are the bomb. You guys are keeping the lights on in this place. We love you guys. If you guys want to join the Patreon a subscriber uh, stuff, this podcast is it's derailed. in the description, guys. It's derailed. It's in the description. Please join in. Oh, yeah. By the way, this week, uh, we're doing a live Zoom call right after the Pakistan-Australia game. So that happens on the Friday. We're meeting up on the Saturday or the Sunday. Just haven't finalized the date, but it's on this weekend. It's going to be the Patreon subs. It's going to be me and Bashar. We're going to be talking all about the World Cup, all about the Pakistan stuff, everything and anything they want to talk about. It's going to be kind of like a PCT therapy session. Uh, also a South Africa therapy session, if you guys want to join in, because boy, oh boy, what a week. And so, you know, always a good time to join. Always a good time to figure out what you want to do with our, with our community. Discord servers are always live. We've almost hit 500 people on our Discord server. It's an ever-growing community. And it's not only for Pakistani fans. We have Indian fans there. We got uh, Sri Lankan fans there, Bengali fans there. So we appreciate each and every one of them. Thank you guys for signing up. Thank you guys for joining. Today is a podcast about upsets. I think you should be very careful with the verbiage you mentioned because more than upsets, I think these are defeats. These are comprehensive wins. And uh, just to speak to this podcast, there's going to be it's going to be split into four parts. The first part is going to be the Afghanistan versus England match. I think this is very important to discuss. This is um, an Afghanistan team, the underdogs, upsetting the defending champions. The second part is going to be a Netherlands versus South Africa review. And the third part is going to be an interview that we did with Sharis Ahmed, who is the member of the Dutch cricket team. Currently in India. Currently, he's in the 15-man squad. He watched all the action unfold in front of his eyes. And we were lucky enough to get him on the podcast, chat with him, just get real-time emotions, reactions from Sharis. So thank you so much, Sharis, for coming on the podcast. And the last part, and perhaps the most important part, is going to be a Pakistan versus Australia preview. We'll briefly talk about the match, uh, playing 11s, why our guys are sick. So hang tight, grab your popcorn, wherever you are. Let's get into the podcast. The first part, Afghanistan versus England. And underdogs defeating the defending champions of this World Cup. And an England team who I rated to be a team that would go on to win this World Cup again. I, I rated my, in my predictions that England would beat India in the final. But it seems like it may not be possible. And Afghanistan just played some unbelievable cricket. And again, beating them in comprehensively. So I don't know what if we should call this an upset. We should call this a defeat. It is a historic defeat because... This is Afghanistan's second win in ODI World Cups. This is their first win was against Scotland in 2015. This is their second win now against the defending champions. Uh, so initial thoughts, what did you think when you saw the scorecard, saw the highlights of the match? Could you believe it? I could believe it, actually. I, I, Afghanistan is a very capable team. Afghanistan is a team that's been proving its mettle over the years. Actually, if, if I'm being honest, Afghanistan is a team that has improved a lot more than Bangladesh has. Now, that's that's an observation I'm willing to make. Bangladesh uh, got its uh, test status, its ODI status late in the 90s, early in the 2000s. And it's just never been, it's never been threatening. Bangladesh at this point should have been a top five, top eight team. It lurks in the bottom tens. And I think a team that can actually break that medal, break that uh, syndrome of being a quote unquote minnow, which a word I horrendously hate. I dislike that word so much. Afghanistan might be that team. Honestly, Afghanistan has, uh, you know, the, the joke in the Pakistani camp is that Afghanistan is a team of 11 Afridis, Chaid Afridis. <laughs> and, uh, 
And why not? You know, why not? And if there's 11 off of these playing, then you're going to have upsets like this. Now, again, I want to use, make sure that I use my verbiage as well, like you were saying. Very, uh, I choose my words closely because it's not an upset. Uh, one of the things that you, you'll listen to and, and the viewers will, or the listeners will also, also have a chance to experience is what Shahid Ahmed was talking about in his interview with you. He said that it's not an upset anymore. We, we're the top 10 teams at a World Cup. Everybody's here to win. No one's here to make it, you know, get two wins and call it a day. It's, everyone's looking at the semifinals. Everyone's looking at the finals and they want to go through. And just to point out, Afghanistan was a team that automatically qualified for this World Cup. Sri Lanka and Netherlands came from playing the World Cup qualifier. So this is actually not a bad Afghanistan team, especially in Indian conditions when they have that amazing spin trio of Mujib, Nabi, and Rashid. They took eight wickets of the 10 wickets that fell for, for England. So in conditions that may favor them, they could be a lethal team. I mean, like, I don't want to jump too ahead. I know we're talking about that specific game against England, but even today, Australia, Afghanistan played New Zealand and they took three wickets in 11 or 12 balls. Like that's how lethal their spin attack is. It was Rashid Khan, it's Mujib. They're, they're so quick in the air. They're, they're turning the ball both ways, sometimes hitting the pad, sometimes going away. They have a slip at all times, a ca- attacking captaincy as well. So there's a lot of factors that are built into that win against England. And that could have, they almost pulled it off against New Zealand today too. And honestly, if, in, if Afghanistan had won against New Zealand today, I don't think it would have been upset. I think it would have just been a back-to-back. This team is finding its groove finally, and it's, it's, here to, um, it's here to make a statement. Afghanistan is the same team that almost beat Pakistan in Dubai just a few months ago, right? We have to remind ourselves that the way that Pakistan won one of those ODIs was in the last over. In Sri Lanka. In Sri Lanka. My, I'm, sorry, I'm so sorry. In Sri Lanka. I, I apologize to listeners. If I'm being a little bit doozy again, you know, it's sleepless nights, but I still, you know, we're trying to make this podcast happen. That's why we sort of combine everything into one and uh, we're doing our best here. So, you know, don't be relentless. <laughs> I've chosen empathy. Um, yeah. So you're right. Uh, in uh, They almost beat Pakistan in one of the games. And they almost beat Pakistan in one of the games in Sri Lanka. And if there was a close call, right? This team has always knocked at the door of victory and sort of gotten distracted and given it away. So you have to, give this team the pro- this team the props. Afghanistan is a lethal team. On its day, it will beat any team. And I genuinely am fearful for Afghanistan and Pakistan game because that will be a game that would literally go down to the wire. I am I won't be surprised if Pakistan like clinch a victory from the jaws of defeat. That is something that you should everybody who's a Pakistan cricket fan should be really prepared for. Also that game is in Chennai which is in conditions that will favor spinners and i wouldn't be surprised if maybe afghanistan at a fourth spinner they have a Noor ahmed in their squad who is a left arm unorthodox uh leg spinner sort of like a school deep yadav and if pakistan is struggling against school deep yadav if i was the afghanistan captain i would find a way to somehow incorporate Noor ahmed into the team has uh, Noor played any games yet in the world cup no he hasn't i mean with the spin trio they have with majib nabi and rashid i think it's really hard for him to make his spot into the 11. So he's just been carrying the waters and being a 12th man fielding. What makes Nabi so threatening? I know I get the Mujib thing. I get the Rashid thing. I get, I get both of those angles. What is Nabi's thing that makes him so lethal? Like he's almost like a Jadeja, isn't he? I think it's the variation he bowls with that. Like the, he bowled at a good slow pace against England. So he was just letting the ball flight, letting it turn. And he took wickets of left-handers. I think he got the wicket of, David Milan, Sam Curran. So really uh, making them struggle against left-handers struggling against offspin. That's a very common thing. Mohamed Afiz bowled his whole career based on that fact. So Nabi, with all his experience, you know, he's been playing IPL, all the, the leagues in the world, you name it, he's played it. So his variation coupled with his experience is what makes him a really good bowler. I think he's also helping the captain with captaincy field positioning and how to be more attacking. So I think this Afghanistan team, they're a good team. And then looking more into the match, England won the toss. They chose, they chose to field first. Afghanistan scored 284, which according to their batting lineup is a very respectable total. Credits to Gurbaz, who scored 80 off 57 balls. Uh, four sixes, eight fours, striker of 140. Got very unlucky because he was run out. I think 
a century from him was on the cards. And then, uh, you know, a good innings from Ikram, uh, who was a, who is a wicketkeeper who came in for Najib, Najib Zadran. Yeah. So he scored an impactful 58 out of 56 balls. And then in very good cameos by Rashid and Mujib, Rashid scored 23 out of 22. Mujib scored 28 out of 16. And I feel like that innings that he played against Pakistan in third ODI really gave him that confidence to go into this World Cup and smash a team like England. It actually switched that, you know, that clip in his head, which was like, he's not just a bowler. He's not, he's a bowling all-rounder. And he, once you have that confidence, that's all it takes to become a batter. That's the same thing about Hassan. I've actually been seeing Hassan Ali in the nets. And I think that's the switch that he switched on. He's a bowling all-rounder. He knows that. Yeah, he takes the new ball. He, he strikes in the first five overs. But when he comes at number eight, number nine, he can smack a few. And I feel like Majib has gone into that shell where he's like, I'm not, like, you know, sponsor him. Great Nickel, sponsor him. He's at that point now where he's like, I think I, I'm able to secure this win if I need to and score some valuable runs down, down the bottom end. And this is lethal. Afghanistan, especially in these conditions, they're a team to watch out for. You should not be looking, you should not be looking at them as like an easy win. Now, I want to look at the converse POV for a little bit. What is England thinking? What's going on in their heads? How are they bottling this? Because I read a very interesting tweet. I forget by who, but they were saying the past 10 years, England has played modern day cricket. They've reinvented the wheel when it comes to cricket. They've introduced Baz ball. They've introduced Stokes ball. They've introduced Ben ball. I don't know. Like a lot of things are happening for them. They're playing one day cricket, T20 cricket and test matches. They're redefining that. There's the genre there. And then you come out against Afghanistan in a World Cup match, a, a, a match that you should surely have like won in your, with your eyes closed. And England sort of played the cricket that they used to play in 2004 and five. Very timid, very nervous, uh, definitely like scared of the spinning ball. And then even more scared of the straighter, straighter one that comes in. Just no intent, no aggression, just complete washout, you know, hands on the heads, let us go alive, that kind of, vibe, that kind of a vibe. And Afghanistan was like, if they smell blood, they're out and chasing it and they want that win. They want that 40 grand, like you said, in the group stages, and they chase it. So from the POV of an English cricketer fan or an English uh, cricketer in, the, in that camp, what are you thinking? You're like, how did this happen? Looking at the target of 284, a typical, normal Indian batting, uh, sorry, England batting lineup would have chased this in 30 overs, maybe, maybe less, depending on which batsman gets going. Uh, but within, when they got, um, they lost the wicket of Johnny Bairstow early on. And then it looked like the batsmen just kept struggling to get runs, to get bat and ball. They, these are the batsmen that love to get boundaries up front and then just sort of capitalize and keep the ball just under pressure. I think the way Mujib bowled, he got made in up front. Uh, and then Naveen ul Haq also bowled really well. So they weren't really able to get on top of the bowlers. And because they kept losing wickets at regular intervals, they never got the momentum going. They never really put pressure back on the Afghanistan bowlers. And I think that's the only way to tackle an England batting lineup is if you just keep taking wickets. I remember the the game against uh, Pakistan in the last ODI World Cup. Um, they were chasing 330-odd, and they were very close to chasing it. Every single batsman was coming in, smacking it. Juru scored the century, I believe. Butler scored the century. Butler scored the century. And that's the first time in English history where they scored two centuries and lost. Yes. And that was because that Pakistan kept taking wickets. Uh, at intervals so in the end just got them all out and they happened to win the match so same thing here no real impetus or an innings that you could say really got going uh, for England aside from a Harry Brook who looked very promising you know I think in this scenario I think England is really missing a Ben Stokes who is still recovering from a nickel in his hip Ben Stokes in these conditions chasing that score I can only imagine him on one knee literally going to the last wicket and smacking it all over the park. Uh, a huge loss for the, the Cricket World Cup, but for us and for us fans not to see a player like Ben Stokes in action as of yet. But I'm hoping he'll come back soon and, and we can see a more fired up England team because looking at how things are progressing now, I, I think they'll struggle to even win against South Africa or India. I think even Pakistan might give him a good chance. Um, and I just have a really hot take to mention here. Chris Wokes always looks like a good bowler, but only in English conditions. You take him out of England, um, you take away the overcast conditions, which seem to be his kryptonite, 
and he he seems like a like a gully baller. Everyone's smacking him <laughs> everywhere. Yeah. He only balled Poor four Wokes. overs. Poor Wokesy. Yeah. Four overs, 41 runs, and he's your main bowler, not even finishing his quota. So again, I think I may have overestimated this England team, or I shouldn't maybe not make judgments based off of one match, but what I've seen against New Zealand and against Afghanistan here, this doesn't look like the same England team that was uh, playing the past four years. I mean, England has been had a, has had a rough rough going at this World Cup right now. They only lost against New Zealand and they lost against Afghanistan. And the next game was against South Africa and inform South Africa. Or so we thought. The <laughs> great segue. I know. Claps in the in the car. If you guys are listening to the gym in the in the car, you gotta clap for that. South Africa versus New Netherlands, bro. Crazy. I feel like the Dutch have something against South Africa. They beat them in the last T20 World Cup, which I spoke to Shars about this. Uh, that that was one of the most impactful wins of the last World Cup because it literally changed the dynamic of the whole tournament. The Netherlands beat South Africa. I remember watching that match and you had predicted somehow that the Dutch will overthrow South Africa. I just had a feeling and you know what? I predicted predicted the same against this ODI and I was right. I was not surprised when the Netherlands beat You messaged South me in the morning and you were like, yo, turn the TV on. I think the Dutch might win here. You've got something when you're predicting these matches. I hope we can get you predicting for the next match against Australia. I just love a good underdog, bro. I just love a good underdog story. I love when Ireland beat England. I love when Afghanistan beat England. And now Netherlands beating the, uh, the Dutch beating South Africa twice. Oh, come on. What's a better story than that? It's a win for them in ODI World Cups after 16 years. It's their third win overall, but it's their first against a test-playing nation at the Cricket World Cup. Huge. I think this is massive. And just if you zoom out and maybe look at things for the next World Cup, do you think this puts in a case for perhaps adding more teams to the World Cup? Like maybe 14 teams, two groups of seven, and then the top four teams play the semifinals? Top four teams play the quarterfinals and semifinals, yes. I think, I genuinely think that's the way it should be. I mean, that way you get your Pakistan India games, you get your Australia England games, you know, you just keep them in the same groups and all that. You, you could have those games. And it'll be really interesting to see how that progresses. But you're right. I think there's no way that you can keep sustaining this 10 team model. I know it's beneficial for the ICC and the BCCI and, and the ACB. They really want that smaller, you know. You don't want to share the pie, basically. And that's that's a shame because teams like, and it's not only the Netherlands, man. It's it's the Irish. It's the Scottish. Zimbabwe. It's Zimbabwe. West Indians are not in this World Cup. What are you talking about? Two-time champions. So definitely something to think about. A 14-team World Cup, a 12-team World Cup. There's a conversation to be had there. Maybe you only can, maybe the ODI World Cup is not the place for that. Maybe a T20 World Cup is. And T20 World Cup is, happens more often than an ODI World Cup two, two, every two years, right? Uh, twice every four years. So maybe that's the answer. That's how you introduce them more into the, into the big stages and you keep the big boys, you know, and the ODI World Cup, you know, because it's a legacy World Cup. Definitely a conversation to be had there. But if, you, if, if we zoom into this specific game, Bashar, I just love the way the Dutch played. I'm going to be honest. South Africans in this World Cup were looking like the... I don't know how to even describe this. Like nobody was counting them in. Nobody did anybody have them in their top four? I don't think we did. And suddenly they were at the top of the table. They were beating everybody by like a billion runs. It felt like, you know, uh, Van der Dusen and uh, David Miller were just like inherited Ricky Ponting and Matthew Hayden. They were just striking at will. And the strike rates were insane. And they were making like 400 runs at a time and like, like crushing oppositions. It just felt very un-South Africa-like. And then they played against the, against the Dutch. And I was like, oh, there it is. That's my Bavuma, bro. That's, that's my Klassen. That's classic Klassen. He knows, how to, he knows how to bottle a job. And honestly, I was not surprised. There is something about the Dutch and the South Africans. I know there's history there. A lot of South Africans are Dutch by descent. There is, it's a box on India type of thing. Definitely some sort of rivalry there. The world is not capitalizing on that. You know what I would love to see? Give me a tri-series with the Dutch, the South Africans, and maybe the Zimbabweans. And give it to, just give it to me. And let them, play at like, let them play in the Netherlands. I would love that. Because the Netherlands, the Dutch are basically, they're here to make a mark. Uh, I, I heard the interview with Chares. We're going to play it very soon. 
And it was just a delight, man. You know, they're, they're a multicultural group. They really love their cricket. They have a Sikh opener and like a Pakistani leg spinner. It's just all around, it's good vibes. They love their game. And the best thing about them is the Van Meekren stuff. You know, obviously everybody has been looking at it online. Van Meekren's old tweets are getting viral right now where he was talking about, I think it was the T20 World Cup. Um, he, in 2020. It was in 2020. Because of the COVID. Yes. He was saying he, 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 something of the effect of he should be playing cricket right now, but instead he's doing Uber Eats and the rough winners. I got I to gotta, you know, second that guy. You know, I got I to gotta feel for him. We've all been there. We've all wanted to be doing something that was not the job that we were doing. I've Uber Eats many times. So, I, so have you. You know, odd jobs and all that just to keep the, the motor running. And instead you want to be doing something that you love. And now he's at the grandest stage of it all. And he's made an impact. And he's made sure that his name is stamped against the South Africans as the losers that they are right now. And it's amazing. I, we said this before, uh, one of the reels that went viral, one of the shorts that really picked up, was that this World Cup, it's anybody's game. You know, you cannot pinpoint one single team and be like, they're going to win. We had, everybody had their money on England. They're not even in the top four right now as we shoot this podcast. And South Africa are number three, Pakistan are number four. Like Australia was at number 10 at one point in this World Cup. You cannot pinpoint anyone. Australia can make a comeback. They just need to win. And they are capable of winning straight up games. And, you know, New Zealand can still choke. South Africa have already decided that they're not going to make it farther than this group stage. This World Cup is blown open. Place your bets or don't. Don't lose money on this. But it's going to be a fun ride. Two quotes from two legends of Pakistan cricket. The first one, Babar Azam, on the day. Whoever plays good cricket on the day will win. <laughs> and yeah. secondly, from the legend, Sayyid Ajmal, science is the man. Man can do anything. And the Dutch men really did the impossible. It looked like it was the normal South Africa dominating against the Netherlands. They were 112 for six at one point, Netherlands. And then came the innings from their captain. The captain's inning leading from the front. He scored 78 off 69 balls, smashing these South African bowlers all over the park. Uh, that coupled with a roll-off Manor Verber cameo. This man hit one uppercut six there's one six that Sachin hit to Shoaib in the 03 World Cup. And then there's just six that Van der Merber hit. Uh, really a crazy shot. We'll go back and watch that highlight. And then Aryan Dutt in the end scoring three sixes, which really put the score to 245. It was a rain affected match, so for only 43 overs. Um, and then to that, I feel like that kind of helped. So that, was, that helped uh, Netherlands' case there. Like if it was a 50 over game, maybe they would have collapsed. That gives South Africa more time to like build an innings. With 43 overs, you're feeling the pressure when you're like in your 30th over. You're like, yo, I got to chase this down. That's not, I don't have 20 overs left. I only got a few overs left. And South Africa definitely felt that heat. South Africa collapsed, actually. They were at one point, uh, one or nine for six, which is a very similar total to what Netherlands were. But the difference, I guess, is that they had a Scott Edwards and a Van der Merver and an Arian. But, but in this case, um, there wasn't much resistance in a match winning effort from the South African batting lineup. David Miller tried his best. Uh, he was dropped on the boundary, which we thought could be... Shocker. Uh, Shocker. A, probably a catch that could have cost him the whole match, if you look at it in hindsight. Uh, but hopefully, and, and, and gratefully, he got out later on. I really liked how disciplined the bowling lineup was of the Dutch bowlers. Shar is in the podcast, in the interview that's coming up, spoke about how they rely heavily on their analysts and just seeing what lengths to ball against which batsmen, what are the hot zones, what are the weak zones, and just capitalizing on those small tidbits. So all in all, extremely happy for the Dutch players. I think wins like this really open up the tournament, and a South African team that we were considering to be potential favorites has now been beaten by the Dutch. Is that classic South Africa, though? Absolutely. They Talks to South Africa. Living up to their tags of being chokers after being, you know, potential favorites alongside India have now lost to the Dutch. I think the next thing we should be playing is the interview that I did this morning with Shariz. Again, Shariz, uh, we appreciate the time that he took out. He was traveling from Dharamshala to Lucknow for the next match. Um, and I was just constantly messaging him, coordinating with him, and finally was able to speak with him. So enjoy the conversation with Shariz going on in three, two, one. 
We have with us today Sharis Ahmed on the podcast, the man himself who witnessed the action unfold in front of him, literally meters away from him yesterday against South Africa. Sharis, it seems like now Netherlands have become have made it a habit in beating South Africa at World Cups. <laughs> you were there at both of the matches at the T20 World Cup and yesterday at the ODI World Cup. What are the feelings? How was it like? Just unload your thoughts, please. Yeah, um it was crazy. It was absolutely crazy. Um the whole game from the start till the beginning. Um at the start we were a bit down. They took some early wickets and but our skipper Scott Edwards, he led the ship and got us to a pretty good pretty good total at that ground and then after that, yeah, it was madness in the with the ball. How would you rate this win versus the win that happened at the T20 World Cup? Because that win was very historic and very impactful win because that win eliminated South Africa from the World Cup. It yeah. helped Pakistan qualify. And then Pakistan went on to beat New Zealand, which sort of just changed the whole dynamic of the tournament. Yeah, 100%. Um, in terms of like Dutch cricket, I would say last year's win was more like to show the world what we were capable of. And now it's not really an upset anymore. I feel like Dutch cricket, we've made it so far, like getting to a 10-team World Cup is not a small thing. Um, and our goal is not to just win games there. Our goal is to reach those semifinals. And we knew that we had to do a lot for that. And beating one of the big teams was was key for us. I was There's this tweet circulating uh, on the internet of Paul... Uh, Van Meekeren, where he said he was doing Uber Eats just a few years ago, and now he's out here getting world-class players out, beating potential favorites of the World Cup. What's the feeling like in the dressing room right now, having you know done all that, and then now being here? Just a crazy past few months for you guys. Yeah, the the feeling in the camp is it's great. Um, obviously, a win helps, and. But we know, like, uh, we had a big discussion last night as well. We celebrated the win, of course. Um, but we also know, like, the job is not done. We, like I said, we were not here to win one or two games. We're here to reach the semis. And we will to we will need to keep beating big teams. What is the direction like from the captain when you are facing such big teams? I would say giants in world cricket. You guys don't have many opportunities to face these teams until it comes to a World Cup. What is the message sometimes from the from the captain? How do you go about tackling these giants? Yeah, so our team prides a lot on doing analyst stuff. Um, we've got some of the best coaches in the world and some of the best analyst work that goes behind on, behind the scenes. Um, but the chat generally remains the same, just to believe in our skills. And that's got us so far and it's got so far for a reason. Um, so just to believe in those skills and do the job. To me, it also looks like there's a, uh, there's a lot of, um, a mixture between young people and then experienced guys like Vandermover and your team. They've played for South Africa. I think Vandermover has played for the national team for South Africa. There's a couple of other guys who played under 19 cricket for South Africa. Does that help? They bring in their experience and then you like youngsters, like you guys can learn from that. Yeah, 100%. I think it's a major, major point for us in the team. Like the like the age difference in between everyone. Um, like myself as a young so I can learn from Arulov. Um, he's got so many experience. He's played some franchise cricket before. He's played for other teams. So there's a lot that I can learn from. And I think that's one of the big reasons as well of our success is that we learn a lot, whether that's young or old. Um, we learn a lot from each other. You're also interacting with a lot of these great players. You're 20 years old, you're you're young, and I feel like you just want to go out there and learn from as many people as you can. Last year in the World Cup, you were interacting with uh, with Jahal. You met Shadab recently when they toured to Netherlands. Uh, what is your personal mindset when you're at these big tournaments? Do you want to just absorb as much information as you can? And how do you sort of... Uh, tone down the inner fan when you're meeting someone like a Virat Kohli or a, or a Babar Azam? Yeah, um, yeah, it's big. Like um, Growing up, it was always like a dream to play international cricket and being here now playing against some of the great of the game. Um, it's big. Um, but like, yeah, as you said, we're all, we're all players. 
um, but like I love learning. I love having cricket chats with other other leg spinners, in particular, but also at the greats of the game. So yeah, like on the field when we're playing against each other, it's different, and then after the game, it's different. We don't really know what the impact of this win is going to be yet. You know, last year's win, we definitely knew it, it, it Pakistan automatically qualified. There was this funny moment between the captain at the time who mentioned that Bob Razum, uh, he was requesting Bob Razum to win the match so that you guys can finish fourth place. We don't know the repercussions of this match yet, but what does this mean mean to you guys going forward into the tournament? I'm sure it's probably given you lots of confidence for the upcoming matches. Yeah, it's given us a lot of confidence, as you said. Um, but it also puts us in a very good space to make sure to get to reach our goal for the semifinals. Um, like we knew what we had to do. We had to beat big teams in South Africa coming in with two out of two, playing some really good cricket. We know we had to be at our A game to get over the line there. I think it has a lot to do with the mindset. You've got to win first mentally before you go out there to win the match um, on, on a physical basis. So, Sharez, uh, I we really appreciate you coming on the podcast and chatting with us. Um, I also wanted to quickly chat with just from you on a personal front. Uh, you haven't gotten much game time in this World Cup yet. When I used to play for my school cricket team, uh, I was the youngest guy in the team. And the coach used to tell me that you're, you're very young. You have lots of time to go. Um and I was sort of a bit a bit hurt being on the bench. But at the same time, I feel like looking back, I learned so much watching the game and analyzing and just thinking like what I would do if I, would, I was in that place. How are you dealing with this time, uh, not getting your place in the playing 11 yet, but are you prepared? Like if you get the opportunity, are you going to go out there and show your googlies? <laughs> yeah, I would love to show my googlies, yeah. Um, no, I'm, I'm ready for whenever it's needed. Um, but... At the same time, obviously, you want to be playing, but um, supporting the boys, um, getting around them and making sure that when I get more opportunity, I make the most out of it. A couple of the uh, the Dutch guys were here in Canada this past summer playing the GT20. We met uh, so uh, Logan Van Beek and then Max O'Dowd. Is that something in the back of the mind of the players that you guys want to pl- uh, perform and play well at this level so that maybe potential franchise leagues are watching you guys can get contracts we don't want a position where players like a paul van meekeren are doing uber eats again yeah 100 percent um i think um, a world cup especially here in india is massive uh it brings out a lot of opportunities for guys if you perform well you get recognized and of course the whole world's watching so yeah you do well you get recognized and who knows you get some deals somewhere and I think for us as a team, that's massive. That's massive. What was the vibe like at home when you when you called back after the win? Um, we're very proud parents. I'm, I'm hoping. Yeah, uh, yeah. My both my parents they they love watching Dutch cricket. Um, they love watching cricket in general, of course. Um, but yeah, they were all very happy, um, very stoked for the win. They were watching it on TV, and then my brother as well, Musa, who also plays for the Netherlands. He he was very happy for the boys as well. So no, it was very nice. It was a cool moment after the game. I, I phoned them straight away uh, to check on them and they were all very happy. You could hear it in the voice. The, the voices don't lie. Well, Charles, no. <laughs> we really appreciate you taking the time out. We would love having this connection with you. We, we appreciate you coming on the podcast and we hope that we can have you on soon again. If you're ever in Toronto uh, for playing any of the leagues or just in Toronto, hit us up. We would love to hang out. And okay. again, congrats on the massive win. Uh, we don't want to underestimate how, how huge of a win this is. And I would like to say this is not an upset. This is a, this is a defeat. This is a comprehensive win. So exactly. again, congratulations. Uh, and we hope to have you back soon again on the Backward Point podcast. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. And that was the conversation with Shahid Ahmed from the Netherlands team. Lovely, insightful conversation. Such a happy-go-lucky guy. You know, he hasn't gotten much match time yet, but he's just happy to be a part of a winning side. And that's the confidence. That's the attitude you need to sort of progress in a tournament like this. It's a long tournament, man. It's only been a third finished, and we've already had so many different um, different results come in that have cho- changed the dynamic of the entire tournament. One thing I want to discuss is how does this win that the Dutch secured against South Africa and the win that the Afghanis secured against 
the English sort of come in play for Pakistan. Because both of those surprises, I don't want to call them upsets, because again, we've ma- maintained the fact that this was not an upset. These are teams that are here to win. Both of these surprises have sort of helped Pakistan. Pakistan has not moved from that fourth spot. They're good. They're solid. Absolutely. And secondly, you know, whenever they do face South Africa, whenever they do face England coming up, it'll be in the back of their mind that they really don't have any margin for error. Uh, the Pakistan team, as of right now, they have two wins, one loss, and they're going up against an Australian team who's coming off of two losses, and they've just registered the first win of this World Cup against Sri Lanka. So really depends on how Pakistan's next few games go. Uh, I think this next match is at Bengaluru, which I'm very concerned is because it's one of the smallest grounds in India. It's uh, Virat Kohli's home ground for RCB in the IPL. We've seen humongous scores uh, in the IPL on this ground. Also in ODIs, this is the same ground where Rohit Sharma scored his double 100. So you can imagine, you know, yes, credits to Rohit Sharma for being a wonderful batter, but it just gives you an idea of how good this batting strip is going to be. You're saying ABD double century loading? Bro, we got to talk about how like half the Pakistan team was Bro, sick. I'm all here for segways. Did you see that segue? What's going on? I don't like for the segue or the team? The segue. segue. <laughs> segue. I don't know, man. I'm and just, the team. I'm on fire right now. And so is Abdullah Shafiq because he has a really high fever. What is going on with the Pakistani team, man? I honestly, is it a bug? Is it, you know, dengue? Is it Dengu? I don't know. I, the CBA, uh, Arslan was like, yo, maybe Roy was, maybe Gil was just like really close to all the players and coughing and all that. All fun in games. That's definitely not what happened. But it, it is concerning. Um, does this call for backup players? Do the reserves get a chance to play in if Abdullah Shafiq is, you know, down and down in the dusk and just like not feeling it? The Ken Mahmoud Hari is coming open. Lots of questions, no answers yet. We'll definitely get the answers in a bit, but I don't know, man. I just hope the recovery is going well for these players. First, you have a horrendous loss against India in their home ground. You get battered. Your spirits are broken, as they always are when you lose against India in that fashion. And then you come back home, you travel, and then you get sick. It's just like, when is the, when are these guys going to have a good day? Maybe on Friday? I think there's a couple of things to discuss here. The first one being that Osama Mir was actually sick during the game against India. So, did Babar Azam play Shadab because Osama was not available or was Shadab his first choice? Now that Osama is fit again, does Pakistan play Osama ahead of Shadab Khan? And secondly, Shaheen and ABD from the playing 11, they were sick. They had a severe flu. But as I've heard, they would rejoin the team for the practice session that happened yesterday or today. So, they're looking to be fit for the match. So what are your thoughts on the first point that I mentioned? Osama Emir in for Shadab Khan. Is that the only change that we recommend for this match? I read somewhere Osama Emir in for Nawaz. What do Bro, you think about I that? I don't know about playing two leg spinners. I, I keep saying this thing. The last time in a World Cup where Pakistan played two leg spinners, this was against India. 2015 ODI World Cup match in Adelaide. We all know what happened there. Virat Kohli showed up, scored a hundred, scored a hundred, 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 hundred. Definitely scored, he scored a century. Okay, and Pakistan <laughs> lost that match. So is that def- that's the worst loss that Pakistan has ever had against India in the World Cups, right? The 2015 one. Pakistan was never in that game. No, the worst by margin was the 2019 one. But but, but which one hurt more? <laughs> 2015, bro. Come on, like you're literally opening with Ahmed Shahzad and Yunus Khan. Come on. Yeah, Why was, was that opening? was just a bad vibe. Why was he opening? I don't know. Great test player, horrible one-day player, Yunus Khan. And then surprisingly, he wins you the T20 World Cup. He's the captain of that. So that's, that's just all weirdness going on here. Um, Imagine a, an event. This is an event of only Pakistan captains who have won ICC trophies. So Imran Khan, Yunus Khan, and Safraz Ahmed on the stage together talking about winning an ICC tournament. Maybe this could be a backward point feature. Who knows? Got to wait for Rocky to come out of jail. Yeah, got to wait for my boy to step out of a t- Badiala, bro. That man's just like not having it. But yeah, I just, I don't know. Osama Amir for Shadab, it's time. That's what you wanted to hear, right? I've been beating around the bush for a while. Everybody wanted to hear that. Osama Amir for Shadab, it's time. That's it. That's the tweet. This is the time where Bob Razum 
really puts his foot down because you have six games left in this World Cup right now, minus the semis and finals if you reach it. So if you want to make any changes to the team, now is the time to do so. And I feel like Osama in for Shadab is a need of the hour now. Shadab, since the Asia Cup, or even I would say the Ivanathan series, has not been at his best. This is not the Shadab Khan that we have come to know over the past six, seven years of his career. And it really feels like he's struggling in the ODI format, bowling 10 overs spells. So Osama Mir in for Shadab. Let's see that change. And then also just overall expect a high scoring match. Just FYI, this is also the same ground where Ireland did their highest successful World Cup chase. Or actually, before Pakistan beat Sri Lanka in this World Cup, it was the highest World Cup successful chase. So same song, same ground. Jinnah same song. ground. Be scared. David Warner is up there. Mitch Marsh is up there. Let's talk about Australia for a second because that this is a great this is a great opportunity for us to sort of dissect the team that the great cricketer follows and and the agony that they're going through. I'm thoroughly enjoying. No disrespect to the great cricketer. I think they're amazing. What is happening to them? Bottom of the table at some point? Like what is this? Is this the Australian team that's won five World Cups? Like I love it. I think it's you know in the NBA there's always after a few years, if you like stop following the NBA, the team that you thought was like number one is no longer number one. And you're like, what is happening? Like the Lakers are like bottom of the table now and they just want to chip like three years, four years ago. It's like that right now for the Australians. Like if you just picked up a fan from 2003 and showed him the table today, you'd be like, what? This is the same team that's like just about to dominate and not lose a single World Cup match and like freaking... 12 years or 36 games altogether. Like, this is that same team. What is happening to them? Who broke them down? What flu are they on? I feel like they don't really know exactly what combination to play. Before the tournament, we looked at their team and they had a lot of all rounders, and we feel like that was probably the way to go uh, this tournament. But it seems like they just haven't really gotten going. They do rely quite heavily on David Warner to score a lot of runs. Last ODI World Cup, I think he was one of the highest run scores for them, if not the highest run score. So again, Warner not firing up, Smith getting unlucky. I think the last game he played, um, he got a really unlucky LBW decision. And then I personally feel like Marnus Labuschain at number four or five is, he's a bit too slow. His strike rate isn't up there in terms of what Australian standards are supposed to be. Uh, and also with these flat pitches, uh, short boundaries, quick outfields, even a bowler like Stark, Hazelwood, and Cummins, they look ordinary, if I'm being very honest with you. So, yeah. We so people should have gone Shaheen to shut up. I was going to get to that. Like people, okay, Shaheen, I think Shaheen, we are overcritical because we expect better from him. And there's also this conversation about his injury and his pace being down. You know, at least if Stark is getting smashed, He's getting smashed at 145, not like Shaheen who's bowling 135 average pace. Right? I see what you mean. I see what you mean. That's a fair criticism. But like, again, at the end of the day, it's like nobody's getting wickets here. None of the... Somehow, Hasan Ali is? That's weird. Who would have thought that? Not, not the redemption arc. We called it here. Not on my bingo card. My buddy. man just got Rod Goldie out. Yeah, he did. Why does Speed call it Virat? You know Speed? Yeah, I know. I love, yo, I love that he's at the World Cup. The FDICC had half a marketing team. They would have like paid this guy to come. Half a marketing team. This guy is just phenomenal. This is like a fish out of water situation. He's like getting but, pictures with Jay Shaw. Love it. I love it. Like that's he's really bringing in a positive vibe, a fun vibe. Get more of that. Get get the K, get KSI involved. You know, get get more. You know who's a big cricket fan? Will Arnett. Really? I was just listening to his podcast. I forget who it was. Oh, Bill Simmons. His podcast, Smartless, his uh, guest was Bill Simmons. Love Bill Simmons. He was talking about how he follows all the sports. He was following the Ashes. He follows the T20 World Cup. He watches cricket. He, he's a big fan. And I, want, I really want to interview him for this podcast. He's a fellow Canadian. Love Bill Arnett. He's, he's my favorite Batman. He's my favorite Batman. And I think... Lego Batman. Lego, well, yeah. Lego, he voiced Lego Batman. But if you've seen Lego Batman, you know what I'm talking about. It's a, it's a timeless gem. Of, a, of cinema yeah he's a cricket fan like the ICC should have gotten him involved like, also he, Hugh Jackman guys Hugh Jackman is a cricket fan he's massive Ed Sheeran is a cricket fan Chris Martin played cricket like 
these people are huge fans. You should get them involved instead of getting freaking, I don't know, man. I don't want to hear it. We get it. How many times am I going to hear Sunidhi Chauhan and, and, you know, Sukhvinder Singh singing Chak De India. <laughs> you know what? Give me some co-play at the World Cup. Is that too much to ask? I guess Maybe because the World Cup is in India, they want to have Indian representation. Fair. Fair enough. Fair enough. But it's always a good, it's a good opportunity to get that, get them involved. The last World Cup in the UK, that's a missed opportunity for co-play. Or potential reunion for the Oasis. For the Oasis? The Oasis. You did this Oasis. with Matt Whitecross too, by the way. Jesus Christ. And you also <laughs> killed him on the podcast. Formerly <laughs> known as Matt Whitecross. No, I think... Um, what were we talking about? I think we're getting sidetracked a bit. Back to the game. Love it. I Pakistan, love when we do that. Australia. Uh, no, yeah, you said Virat. Uh, yeah, Virat. KSI. Uh, sorry, I, I show speed says uh, Virat. Yeah. So I don't know why he says that, but I love it. I, I think it's, it's adorable. I think he's a great guy. I think he's really funny. And yeah. What do you think it's Pakistan be... should do when they win the toss? Do you think they're a better chaser? Because when they played against Sri Lanka, it looked like they were good chasers. When they were playing against India, it looked like they were horrible uh, target setters? batting team to set a target because they didn't really know what a good score was. The, a big criticism of the Pakistan batters and Bob Rosen was that they don't know how to assess conditions and how to assess the pitch. Like the game against Sri Lanka, they only played good because they had played so many warm matches in Hyderabad. They had played uh, the Dutch at Hyderabad. So they sort of knew and understood the conditions. But this being the first match, and I think the only match they're playing at Ahmedabad, they did not know how Wait, to assess Are the they conditions. playing in Ahmedabad? Oh, they, in they the were. India game. The India game. So oh, I see. Okay. They weren't sure exactly how to assess the conditions and, and what to do when they win the toss or what a good score is. So, I mean, same thing here. This is their first match in Bengaluru. What should they do? I think if Babar Azam's stars are aligned, he loses the toss and he's he gets he doesn't get this he doesn't get to decide, but he is told what to do, and I think that's the best for him. I think personally speaking, I think Pakistan should chase. That way, you get a feel of the pitch kind of see what's going on if they miraculously you know get australia under 300 they kind of will back themselves up to chase chase that down even though because they just did it a few weeks ago also at batting under lights a lot easier comes on the bat easier do factor do factor it's india lots of do going around ball gets wet zampa looks rusty box but to be honest australian balling lineup look looks rusty and watch me say that and they're just like Suddenly, are like Jimmy Anderson and Stuart Broad in overcast conditions in freaking Manchester. But just watch me, just jinx this. But so far, so so good. They look very ordinary. I don't think Zampa looks really bad. If I'm being honest, like I know he's he's had a Shadab Khan type situation going on where he's just clicking out of form in the wrong moment. And I think if you're Pakistan, you attack that. You go with the same combination. Imam Abdullah Shafiq, they're fine. The only change you make is you get Usama Amir in for Shadab. And you hope that Osama Amir has an Abdullah Shafiq type tournament. Simple as that. Agree, 100%. On that positive note, I would like to sign off the podcast. Before that, I, I know I want to sign off the podcast. Too, and I, I'm, I'm sorry to cut you off, but give me a quick win. Who's going to win that game? Australia versus Pakistan on Friday. Well, my mind says Australia. My heart says Pakistan. I'm torn apart in between. I don't know what to say. My heart and mind says Pakistan. I think Pakistan are coming back with vengeance. You don't think so? Pakistan. Australia. Is gonna win. Box straight. Is gonna Cricket win. is gonna be the real winner. Cricket is gonna be the winner. You shut up. You you did you get out of this podcast. All right. So I guess that's a great way to wrap up or not. You tell me. I think for our uh, Dutch brothers and and fans who love the game, I think an orange heart is the emoji of the day today. If you made it this far, we really appreciate it. You guys are the real MVPs. We got a little bit of a slack from the last last episode. Kind of went viral in the wrong areas of the internet. But it's okay. Our fans were really steadfast. They they pulled through. Nobody engaged. We love that. Our Discord server was also a little bit plagued by said, um, you know, Atakmadis. When you play with fire, you expect to get burned. Yeah. And I got a little bit triggered, but, you know, the fans and the supporters and the Patreon supporters actually were the ones who sort of calmed us down. It was like, yo, just ignore. It's going to, it's a wave. It's going to, it's going to ride off. And uh, even CBO was talking about this. He gets a lot of that flack from, a certain corner of the internet. So it was a learning curve for sure. Um, I want to thank all the fans, everybody who watches us, everybody who listens to us, the Spotify gang, you know who you guys are. You guys are the best. So thank you very much for entertaining us. Thank you very much for being entertained by us. 
And I guess we guys will see you very soon in the next podcast. Appreciate for appreciate the love. Apologize for the long tantrums and rants and just you know being sort of cookie died and we haven't been getting a lot of sleep in this house. But hopefully to coming back with the Park Australia game review with positive news and a reinvigorated spirit in this World Cup. Let's get it. Let's get it. Cheers, bro. Cheers.